Sorry about that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual home composting workshop. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis, a member of the composting team at the Institute for Local Self Alliance, which is a national nonprofit founded in the district back in 1974. Uh, today's workshop is sponsored by the DC Department of Public Works and is hosted by us at ILSR. Public Works has contracted with us to provide home composting training and a run its home composting system rebate program. Alrighty, so let's get started. I'm joined today by my colleague, Brenda Platt. Uh, Brenda is the director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. So say hi, Brenda. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Monday evening. Great, so Brenda is a master composter and she and I will be your trainers today. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. Everyone is in listen-only mode. Uh, we should have plenty of time for questions at the end, but we will pause periodically as we go to see if there are any clarifying questions about what's being presented. Uh, type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel in the questions box as they come up, um, and we'll get to them when we stop for questions. Uh, we will also run a few interactive polls towards the end of the workshop, so get ready to give us your answers. Uh, if you're a DC resident and want to qualify for the rebate, which is up to $75, you must attend an online workshop live. Congrats, that's what you're doing right now. Uh, and stay through the entire presentation. Today's event is being recorded and all attendees will receive a link to the recording as well as the slide deck. So no worries there. Now, before we get started on composting at home, some of you asked where you can drop off your food scraps. If you're in the district, you have a few options. One is the DC Department of Park Department of Park and Rec's Community Compost Cooperative Network. Turn off my webcam for a second. Sorry, y'all. And I can hear you. Okay. I just turned off my video. It seems like um, the storms in the area may be affecting my internet. So, uh, so back to the DPW uh, Public Works Food Scrap Drop-Off Program. Um, this happens at City Farmers Markets. To learn more about this, go to the website and check out the hours of operation. Most of these are happening on Saturday mornings uh, between 8 a.m. and noon, but DuPont Circle, for example, is open on Sundays. So check out the website for more. Yet another option is to subscribe to a private service. The DC area is lucky in having a number of entrepreneurs who will pick up your food scraps weekly. Compost Cab, Compost Crew, Veteran Compost, and O-Scrap are some of the operators we know about. They charge a monthly fee for this service, um, but there may be other providers of that service. So do some Googling. Um, okay, this again, this workshop is part of the DC Department of Public Works' home composting program. Um, and if you're just joining us, you must live in DC and att attend this workshop live in order to qualify for the rebate. And you have to stay for the entire presentation, at least up until the Q&A. Basically, that means you can't just watch a recording of the webinar to later to qualify. But we do welcome everyone to this workshop, regardless of where you live. Alrighty, so now a snapshot of you, our participants. Uh, when you registered, we asked you to rate your experience with home composting on a scale of one to five. So 24% uh, uh, consider themselves complete newbies. 43% know a little bit, but not much. 27% say they've been composting for a while, but still run into challenges. 6% uh, say they're experienced but still have something to learn, don't we all? And none indicated they are very confident about their home composting ability. Well, hopefully that will change by the end of this presentation. Um, we also asked you to give us an idea of the size of your yard. 
5% uh, of us are very lucky with big yards, 29% have medium, 8% have small, and majority, 58%, have little outside space, but no one reported no outside space. Um, so that's a very good mix, and welcome to everyone. At this point, we should note that this is a hot composting workshop, workshop, and it does assume that you have access to some outdoor space, as this type of composting generally happens outdoors. But if you are someone who is looking to compost inside, such as in an apartment, then vermicomposting or composting with a worm bin may be a better fit for you. To qualify for a rebate for a vermicomposting system, you'll need to participate in the separate vermicomposting workshop or webinar. The hot composting and vermicomposting rebates are separate rebates, and you can only qualify for one per household. Why? Because composting with worms is completely different than hot composting. Worms don't like to get hot, for instance. They like the same temperature we do. Also, vermicomposting is based on surface area, not volume, which is another difference with hot composting. Um, so uh, the systems that qualify for the rebate are completely different. Unfortunately, we don't have another vermicomposting workshop schedule, scheduled at this time and don't expect to until the winter. If you are interested in vermicomposting, please check out this site with reputable information by our friend and extension agent, Rhonda Sherman at North Carolina State University. Alrighty, now I'm going to hand the mic to my colleague, Brenda. All right, thanks, Linda. Sorry about the technical difficulties. When you come back on, we'll see if you can get your webcam on when you're um, talking. So folks, we're gonna switch off, Linda and I, on this. This is the uh, outline of what we're gonna talk about in the hour and a half, two hours that we have today. So we're gonna go through what is compost? We're all on the same page and what are some of the benefits? go through some of the common systems. Some of you asked about that. Linda's gonna do a deep dive on setting you up for success. So what are the key ingredients to composting? The materials you can put in, the materials you should leave out, the recipe, how to make your pile, some things to keep in mind, what's important. Um, then she'll hand it back to me. I'll go through some troubleshooting. Um, and uh, more, and then I'll hand it back to her, <laughs> and she'll go through when compost, knowing when your compost is ready and how to use it, and then um, she'll hand the mic back to me, and I'll go through some common systems for home composting, and then we'll get into the rebate program and the DC regs uh, that allow you to, to do home composting, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers as we go, as Linda mentioned. We're gonna pause throughout. One thing I'll just say now is that our nonprofit, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, uh, which is offering this training and managing the rebate program for the DC Department of Public Works, our contract with Public Works ends in like three weeks. So if you are interested in a rebate, do not wait to give the to submit those to us. So keep that in mind as like coming out of this workshop. If you haven't already bought your bin and you want to buy a bin. You know, ask those questions now while you while you have us, okay? All right, so let us um, let's get started. So, what is compost? Well, it's a soil amendment, meaning you add it to soil to improve it, but it's not soil itself. It's a soil enhancer, and it's full of stable plant available nutrients, and it's rich in what we call organic matter. I like to call it black gold, and that's a picture of me holding up my black gold made in my own backyard. One thing to know is it's a biological process. So if we can, it, but if we control certain conditions, materials are gonna decompose quicker. So let me just cover some basic reasons you might wanna compost. And we asked you what your driver, um, when you registered, we asked you what was motivating you. Um, and we had many reasons. There are many reasons to compost. It's a terrific way to celebrate Earth Day every day. I think we're gonna find in DC that we're too good at removing those fall leaves and our yard trimmings, that we're gonna find our, our backyards and front yards are starved of organic matter. So we can really build healthy soil right in our own um, neighborhoods. And compost, um, sorry, I went a little too fast, is all about the soil. So um, there's so many soil benefits. It enhances soil tilth and fertility. When you add compost to soil, it can help suppress 
suppress plant diseases, it can stimu stimulate root growth so it and improve something that we call cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of soil to retain nutrients. One of the biggest benefits, I think, is it helps soil retain water, so it improves its water holding capacity. So when we have a lot of uh, wet conditions like we've been having, it helps um, prevent the soil from eroding and washing away. It helps keep that soil in, in place. And then when we're going to have the in, in, inevitable drought conditions, it's going to be the difference between our tomato plants surviving and not su surviving. And it enhances soil structure, supports soil biology, so many other things. So this is actually part of a poster we produced a few years ago on the benefits of soil. We did um, part of the infographic also as climate benefits. We have a new climate poster that uh, Linda's going to put the link in the chat, so check that out. It's a little long, um, the infographic, so it didn't lend itself to our slide deck today. But really what you can see here is when we throw away our food scraps in a landfill, it's producing methane, you may, be, may have heard of that, that's CH4, and methane is a highly potent greenhouse gas. It's like 84 times more potent in its global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So we really need to, and what contributes to methane is all this rotting food and yard waste that we throw away. The reason that you get methane in a landfill is it's uh, anaerobic conditions, meaning starved oxygen, anaerobic versus aerobic, which means you have oxygen. So when the compost, when you have organics in anaerobic conditions, you produ produce methane, but composting is aerobic. It needs oxygen and, and you don't want it to go anaerobic, which is why compost piles that are properly op um, maintained will not generate uh, methane. In our area, our garbage goes to the Lorton incinerator in Fairfax County, and even there, you know, incinerators are continu continuously emitting carbon dioxide and other uh, pollutants, climate and otherwise. So throwing away your trash and your food scraps is not so great, but when you make that black gold and you add it to soil, you're creating a carbon sink and you're drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, you're helping the soil um, keep that carbon in the soil. It's now recognized that healthy soils um, is a really key strategy in the short term and the long term for mitigating climate disruption. Not only that, but when you add compost to soil, you've got bigger plants and bigger yields and bigger roots and bigger leaves, so you're enhancing the photosynthesis process, so drawing down even more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And there's other benefits too, but that's just a highlight. Some of you mentioned you want to reduce your trash, so that's an, um, an excellent uh, um, driver for composting. This is based on U.S. average figures that shows that about one half of what we put out the curb every week is readily compostable. And this is after recycling. So after the fall leaves you know, are, are, are raked and taken to a compost site, this is what's left over. One fifth, 21% is food scraps alone. So we could be doing a lot better on reducing our, our garbage. This is um, part of a social media graphic. It's available in these four squares that kind of brings together all those benefits. So um, if you go to that website, feel free to use use these and share them but one the benefits of composting reduce waste enhance soil grow our community and protect the climate so that kind of just brings those um, key benefits together all right so now i wanted to share with you that one of the best things about composting is there's no one way to do it and it can be large scale small scale like a bin in our backyard or a worm bin in our apartment or classroom and literally everything in between. And these are just some photos of mostly compost systems in our area. So this is um, this one in the middle is the Montgomery County Yard Waste Facility up in Dickerson, Maryland. This is um, in Maryland too. It's a cow manure farm-based um, composting um, uh, site. This one up here on the top left is College Park Yard Waste. This is a farmer, Potomac Vegetable. Um, Prince George's County. This photo here on the right is a three bin system in Baltimore at a community garden. And um, that one is um, very more labor intensive with, with pitchforks. But this one right above it, another three bin system, that is uh, horse manure being composted in Northern Virginia. And one thing I want you to notice is how is the oxygen getting into the pile? So even when we're composting on a home composting scale, we want to get air into the pile. So here they've got blowers 
lowering the air in. This Baltimore site pitchforks is going to be their best friend. These um, elongated compost piles are called windrows, and these are called turners, windrow turners, and there's workers sitting on top of it or pulling a tractor, pulling the, tur the turner, but that's an auger that's fluffing this pile up and getting air in there. So no matter how you do it, you need oxygen. Here's a few more photos of different systems. Um, this is um, on a rooftop in Brooklyn, New York, where there's an urban farm, and they have blowers too. They're solar powered. This is our colleague, Jeffrey Neal, with Loop Closing, a consultant here in the DC area. And this is at the Kelly Miller Middle School in Ward 7. And he's got a Rydan in vessel rotating drum uh, there that's handling a little bit um, kind of more school cafeteria waste and other. Uh, kitchen scraps. This is a rocket in vessel system that's very popular at schools. But you know, at the home composting scale, there's lots of systems. You can make your own. Um, there's tumblers that come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And um, even within home composting, you would be surprised how many options you have. We're going to talk more about and show you lots of photos of different options towards the end when we talk about the rebate and what you can use the rebate for. But I just want to introduce here the basic six options where you have kind of more like an open wire bin, which we do not do not recommend if you're in a part of DC that has a lot of rodent infestation, so you know there are rats in your neighborhood because it's open, nor do we recommend these kind of repurposing these wooden pallets for these open systems. But if you're in a part of DC that has no rodent problems, bigger yards, you know, you're one of those lucky people with the big yard, lots of yard, mature trees with leaves, and you want an open system, these, these could work well for you. I love the three bin system. We'll show you um, more pictures of those. And you can enclose them as well to be more rat resistant. But the rebate is going to really apply to these um, kind of more branded systems that you can buy. And there's tumblers, which rotate. There's single chamber. There's dual chamber, which has two sides. Um, and then there's um, what we call stationary systems, which don't tumble. They kind of just sit on the ground. In fact, these other wooden ones here are stationary systems because they're not tumblers. But you can buy. Uh, these kind of stationary systems that come in a variety of, of sizes and you can add at the top and harvest at the bottom or in a multi-bin system you can start on one side flip the pile onto the second side so there's lots of options and um, we'll talk uh, more about those so let me just um, before I hand the mic to, to Linda to talk get into the kind of key ingredients for success. Let me just say a word about the difference between passive or cold composting and hot composting. So one thing we want to emphasize to you all today is that you can home compost at whatever level of effort you would like to do it at. You don't need to be tracking temperatures if you don't want to, but it is good to know that if you aren't optimizing the conditions for the microbes in the process, that the process is going to be slower. So if you're going to do more passive composting, you know, it's more low effort, you're not going to pay as much attention to watering, it's going to take it's going to take longer. It could take a year before you have that black gold. And also, if you're not reaching high temperatures, you may have weed seeds growing in your pile. So it's just something to know. But if you're going to be more active and you're going to take advantage of some of the tips we're sharing today and you're getting the oxygen in, you're turning it, you're paying attention to moisture, it could be quicker. Compost, the active compostings we're going to go through in some details like the first two to three weeks of a batch, but it needs time to finish. So even, even with hot composting, you want your compost to mature and stabilize, and that process can still take six months. But one of the benefits of doing hot composting is that you'll kill the weed seeds you don't want, um, you'll prevent them from germinating, and you're going to reduce any risk of pathogens. So just kind of want to set that up. But again, um, you can do it at whatever um, level you want to. All right, I'm going to hand the mic to Linda, and we can see you. And if your uh, um, volume uh, voice is breaking, I'll let you know. Awesome, thank you. Okay, it looks good so far though. Um, all right, so now we're gonna look at the compost pile food web. Um, so there are 
a diverse array of organisms that thrive in a compost pile at different points during the composting process. Some of these guys we can see with our eyes, some we cannot. Um, but composting happens because of their efforts. Um, these are your volunteers, you can think about it that way. Um, but your job as a home composter is to make them happy. Uh, microorganisms or organisms that are too small to see with your naked eye, such as bacteria, fungi, and other microbes, feed on organic residues like leaves, kitchen scraps, and yard trimmings like you can see here. These are the first level decomposers that thrive in the compost pile. As these microorganisms consume materials, the pile will heat up. As your pile cools, it becomes inhabited by common soil microorganisms like protozoa, worms, mites, and insects. And then other larger organisms feed on them and the organic matter that they produce. So those are the second and third degree decomposers. The composting process is teeming with life, as you can see from this graphic. Conditions in the pile change as the composting process proceeds, and this diversity of life helps the process continue. Alrighty, so uh, no matter what system you're using uh, or what scale you're composting at, you need to know about the ingredients for good compost, which you can see here. These are air, water, and food. And just like us, our composting microbes need these things to survive and thrive. Uh, let's start by taking a look at our microorganism's favorite foods. Um, we live on a carbon-based planet, so everything has some amount of carbon in it, but greens refer to materials that are relatively high in nitrogen, whereas browns refer to materials that are relatively low in nitrogen. Here you can see examples of green materials, which include fresh veggie and fruit scraps, cut flowers and plants and garden trimmings, and while not actually green in color, coffee grounds and tea bags also fall into this category. The browns category includes materials like fall leaves, untreated straw, shredded newspaper, woody plant stalks, twigs and branches, and untreated wood chips and shavings. All right, so listed here are the materials we recommend for home composting and the materials we recommend avoiding, especially for those newer to the composting process. On the yes list are green materials like fruit and veggie scraps, eggshells, coffee grounds, paper filters are okay, tea bags with staples removed, and garden trimmings, such as tomato leaves and vines. Recommended browns include fall leaves, plant stalks, think the stalk of an old kale plant, for example, wood chips and shavings without chemical treatment again, and shredded newspaper, but no glossy pages. Um, also on this list are brown paper bags. Certain materials can be problematic for new composters and systems that lack active management. So we therefore recommend avoiding them. Meat, dairy, oil, and grease and pet waste should be avoided in these cases as they may cause odors or introduce the potential for pathogens. When you have odors, you increase the risk of attracting rodents. Also, rodents cannot thrive off of fruit and vegetable scraps alone. They need a balanced diet that includes protein. So if you deny them that food, um, you're less likely to attract them. So, uh, all right, other materials contain chemicals or can act as physical contaminants. Produce stickers and other pieces of plastic or metal, for example, will need to be removed eventually. Asking your family members or housemates to remove these items before composting will save you the trouble from having to remove them later in the finished compost. Pet wastes have a high likelihood of containing pathogens such as toxoplasmosis, which is prevalent in cat feces and can be extremely infectious. As such, don't compost pet wastes, especially if you're new to composting or plan to use your compost to grow edible plants. Uh, treated wood and glossy papers may contribute to unwanted chemicals to your compost. And as a general rule, also avoid diseased or poisonous plants and aggressive weeds. If you keep weeding it from your garden, don't put it in your compost. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. Uh, certain herbicides will persist through the composting process. So compost made with plants treated with herbicides may damage the plants we want to grow. So they're also good to avoid. Um, we also recommend avoiding dryer lint since most of our clothes are no longer made of natural materials and will likely introduce plastic or synthetic materials into our compost. Uh, used tissues are on the list simply because no one wants to be handling someone else's used tissues, especially if that person may be sick. For a home composter, that's more of a personal preference. Uh, but just generally thinking about what you put in your compost, you want the good, clean stuff. Um, and something to teach your housemates and family, when in doubt, leave it out. Okay, a note on products labeled as compostable. Um, they are often not designed to break down in home composting systems, so be wary of these. Uh, and do look for those products that are certified as compostable by the Biodegradable Products Institute. 
uh, BPI. Paper and other fiber-based food service packaging can be a source of per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances, also known as PFAS, uh, some of which are known to be toxic and bioaccumulative. Composting only BPI certified products will help avoid these chemicals as well as products that are greenwashed as compostable or appear to be compostable, but may be coated with a plastic film. So check out this website, uh, which Brenda put in the chat for more information on those products. Alrighty, so back to our composting microbes. Uh, they need carbon for energy and growth, and they need nitrogen for protein and reproduction. In general, all organisms need about 25 to 30 times more units of carbon than units of nitrogen. Uh, this includes our microbes as well as us humans. We need to supply carbon and nitrogen in the right proportions for our microbes to thrive. If you have too much nitrogen in your compost pile, the excess nitrogen is converted to ammonia and you can have odor issues. You never want more food scraps than browns in your pile, remember that. Uh, so you should always have brown materials on hand and ready to use. In practice, we can achieve the 30 parts of carbon to one part nitrogen uh, by using the same container to measure our materials. You add two to three containers of browns for every one container of green stuff. In this example, you see the same wheelbarrow being used to measure everything out. Uh, so here's a sample recipe that you could use where the browns are a mix of leaves, wood chips, sawdust, and plant stems. Um, you can compost just fine with fall leaves as your browns. Uh, in this time of year, you will probably need a mix of browns such as straw, woody plants, stems, and wood chips. But uh, leaf season is coming up, so start making plants for that. Um, all right, so besides food, our composting microbes need air. By turning or mixing your pile, you are charging the material with fresh air. Turning also aids the composting process by distributing moisture, nutrients, and organisms, breaking up clumps of materials, and invigorating and providing a burst of microbial activity. So in order uh, to continue providing air to microbes over time, you have to make space for air in your pile. You can do this by using a mix of materials of different sizes. Bulkier brown materials help to create air pockets. If you have just a pile of rotting fruit, it's going to be really heavy and dense uh, with little space for air. Linda, I can't hear you now. You are frozen again. Could somebody, let me just see, put in the in the chat if you agree that uh, Linda's frozen and it's not me. Yes, yeah, she's frozen. Okay, I'm going to continue, Linda, until you come back, okay? So, um, the, as Linda mentioned, the secret to composting is oxygen and air, and the way that the air flows through a pile is like the chimney effect. So it's gonna draw cool air around from the sides and it's gonna rise up through the top, which is why Linda's talking about thinking about when you're building your pile, not making it too dense, but um, having that air flow throughout the pile. So um, you wanna kind of, when if you were making a, a campfire or a, a fire in your, ch in your chimney place, right, you would, you would not, stack the um, bins right on top of each other, right? You would create that airflow and you want to kind of harness the same thing in your compost pile to make them happy. Um, all right, so that's just something kind of you are keep in mind uh, that you need to be doing. Um, let's just see, let's just see. Okay, where are we? Um, beware of blocking airflow. This is like um, on the right here is in the fall, some leaves got matted, and if we were just to put those leaves right in the pile, uh, without kind of ripping them apart and creating, you know, um, and creating this this mat, then the air would not be flowing through the pile. So think about that when you're adding material. The same thing we mentioned: you can add some cardboard and some paper, but you never want to add like a sheet of cardboard or a sheet of newspaper without ripping it and mixing it in with some other materials. And um, the slide, the photo on the left here is just some cuttings that you might even have. I mean, this is like, looks like cutting from a rosemary bush or daylily stems. So maybe most of us might find some branches that you can break up and put in your pile to create those air pockets. So I see that Linda's back, so I'm gonna hand the mic back to you. All right, and folks. Um, all right, so on this 
uh, slide, you can see a chart that's, uh, chart that's showing um, how turning can speed up the composting process. Uh, you'll see that more frequent turning seen by Linda, try turning your webcam off. Otherwise, I think I'll just pitch it, pitch it for you. Sorry, folks, we have never had these technical difficulties. I think where Linda is, there's a storm coming through. So, um, as Linda was saying, this chart is just giving an idea of how frequently you turn your pile on the impact on when the composting, how long it takes for it to be done. So again, you can compost at whatever level of activity suits you, but if you're turning, you know, once a month, it's going to take longer, you know, for the pile to, to actually heat up. It may not even heat up that much at all. But if you're turning every 10 days, you'll see a profile like this. It'll you have a spike, it'll come down, it'll spike again, still take longer, but you'll get higher temperatures. But if you're turning initially in the first three weeks, you're turning every three days, you and you, you're paying attention to some of the other things we're going to talk about, the moisture and the oxygen, you should be able to reach high temperatures. And let me just kind of go through now um, some of the um, uh, more detail at kind of temperature and days uh, chart here. And we're going to break it down for you and make it really easy. So um, one of the things that's nice is that science has given us names for the temperature ranges within which those mic certain microorganisms that thrive in a compost pile will thrive. And so the mesophilic temperature range and the mesophilic kind of bacteria and fungi, they're thriving between 50 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when we're going to see this explosive growth of those kind of bacteria and fung fungi. They're going to start breaking down the easy to digest materials. It's going to be like your watermelon or your fruit, mango skins, banana peels. The woody stuff kind of comes a little later during the thermophilic stage, which is above 104 degrees. Um, and this is where you'll kind of get more of the heat-loving organisms that break down more rigid materials like, like wood um, and more of that kind of tougher woody material. But that's also the phase that when you get high up, it's um, going to prevent wheat seeds from germinating and help reduce any risk of, of pathogens. And the curing phase is really at the final stage of composting, and at this point, you shouldn't see any more recognizable food scraps. Um, you may see like the corn cob or half a corn cob or a pineapple top or an avocado pit is still going to be breaking down, but you shouldn't see like, you know, uh, um, banana peel or lettuce core or something like that. And this is what's often forgotten, but you really need a minimum of a month to let the, the compost finish. And, um, and it kind of goes back down to the kind of mesophilic stage as well during this stage. Um, this, what we're showing here in this pink band is what you're really kind of um, aiming for, for, excuse me here, is um, for the area, the desired range that destroys more pathogens, the kind of the fly larva in addition to the weed seeds. At 145 degrees is what, you're need, what you need to reach to prevent most weed seeds from germinating. And sometimes you, you may see a, a volunteer tomato plant in your compost pile, and that's because tomato seeds need closer to like 153 degrees to prevent them from germinating, which was kind of a classic story of having a tomato plant growing in your compost pile. But this line, this orange line we show here is at 131 degrees, and that's the temperature you need to reach to really kill or reduce the risk of most human pathogens and other pathogens that could be a, a risk for, for us. And so, and what we would recommend is that you reach that 131 degrees for three days straight. You may recall in our area, I think it was a couple of summers ago, where we had a recall of romaine lettuce. I can't remember if it was E. coli or salmonella, but we do get, you know, these pathogens on some of the food we're eating and like romaine that would be something that you would normally put in a compost pile so if you're not tracking temperature again it's not a problem but just I would say there that that um, guideline when in doubt leave it out pay more attention to that um, so 
the two most valuable tools you have for monitoring the composting process is a temperature probe, which again, again you don't need, but the other tool that we all have and hopefully works, uh, COVID, long COVID uh, notwithstanding, is your nose, right? And we say in the composting world, the nose knows. So if you have obnoxious smells coming from your pile, something is wrong. That is a putrid, strong odors is a sign that something is wrong and you need to troubleshoot. And we'll kind of go through that in a little bit. But a temperature probe can be a nice investment if it's something you really want to get into. You know, this is a typical um, backyard probe. It's kind of a long uh, two, one and a half feet um, a spiky metal thing. You put it in the compost pile. You can leave it there. You have a stationary system. But in this green uh, phase that's shown on the dial, that's the mesophilic phase. And then the gray, which is hot, is the thermophilic. So you can kind of monitor what's going on. But even if you don't have a probe, you got your pitchfork in there and you're turning your pile, you can see the steam coming out or you can touch it with your hand and you'll know it's getting hot. So you don't really need um, a probe. So the other, we talked about air, we talked about the browns and the greens, the recipe. The other key ingredient to successful composting is water. So our microbes, our volunteer workhorses, those composting microbes, they live in water. Uh, they live in a, a thin film of water around all the materials in the compost pile. And they rely on that thin film that they live in to eat, move around, and then live. So you would be surprised how much water you actually need in your compost pile. It needs between 45 to 60 percent by weight has to be water. That is more than half the weight of your compost pile is moisture. Now, some of that moisture comes in through the wet food scraps, right? Or if you have leaves that are exposed to the elements, they're already, especially this summer, right? You know, it's absorbing the rain and already moist. So you may not have to water your pile as often if you want to optimize conditions. But if you're building your pile from scratch and you have dry leaves, you know, you don't want to build your pile in water after you build your pile. You want to water as you go because that moisture needs to be throughout the pile not just on top and if you water a pile afterwards it's just going to shed the water it's going to run off so getting that moisture throughout the whole pile is kind of important um, if it's too dry the mic microbial activity goes dormant if it's too wet then the water fills all those nice air pockets you've worked so hard to create and so then your pile can go anaerobic so often if it's smelly it could be a sign you have too much water and then as your pile heats up, it's going to um, it's going to drive off the moisture. So you're going to need to check the um, conditions in the pile. All right. So you may ask, well, how do I know if it's 45 to 60 percent moisture? Well, we teach this hand squeeze test. So what you want to do is you're building your pile. You want to grab a, a, a handful of your material and you want to squeeze it. And you want to get ideally a few drops between your knuckles. It shouldn't be dripping wet. You don't want when you hold your arm up that it drips into your armpit. Sometimes we call this the um, armpit hand squeeze test. That's what you don't want is it dripping into your armpit. But you want a few drips between your knuckles or dripping out. But if you were to hold it, um, open your hand, you know, kind of clumps a little bit. But if you hold it and it's kind of dusty and falls apart, not enough moisture. So that's that's basically a tip for you for you to use. It should feel like some people say like a wrung out sponge. Um, so that that could be a useful analogy for you. Um, all right, density we talked about. So there is a sweet spot for how dense your pile is. You don't want it too dense. You don't want it too light. Nothing's going to happen. It's just a pile of hay or straw. But if it's a pile of like banana peels and it's really wet and dense, it's not going to get the air in. So there is kind of um, a sweet spot here. and we kind of visually tried to show this. We, If you were in our class with us, we would do this bulk density test. We'd measure what a thousand pounds a cubic yard looks like. You don't need to worry about it, but just know that if it's too dense, you're, you're, there's no air pockets. There's no porosity in your pile, right? And if it's too light, there's too much porosity. The microbes are not really get, being able to move around the pile to do their work. So you want just that which we kind of visually show here that kind of water film that they can move around each particle. And so there is a sweet spot there. It's just something to, to keep in mind. So what we're going to do here, and hopefully, um, Linda, we can hear her. Um, we're going to just pause here for a few questions. 
and uh, see if there are any. And I just want to just tee up what we're going to do next. We're going to kind of go through um, basic supplies, how to get started, how to set up, and we'll get into different systems. But if you have any questions on kind of the key ingredients to success or the benefits of composting, what we've already covered, this would be a good time. All right. So one of the questions we have is, if ants have taken over the pile, is it because it's too dry? The short answer is yes, it's definitely too dry. That is something, if you have the right moisture, you're not going to turn your compost pile into an ant hill. One thing I'll say is that I occasionally, when my, when my pile of browns is too dry, you can get ants in your leaves leaf pile. So I don't really worry about that. I mean, you can wet them, the ants will go elsewhere if you want, but you know, I just, you know, add the leaves any if there's ants to the pile and my pile's moist and it's hot and the ants aren't in there. So yes, I feel like they're not terrible. They they answered their own question. They knew it was because of the moisture. Um or that was a good sign. Uh what if the pile gets too hot? That is usually um not an issue with home composting. If you're Composting more on the institutional commercial scale, you don't want your pile above 160 degrees because it can kind of just, you know, kill the, the good microbes. So there is that mesophilic and thermophilic temperature range under which they thrive, which is basically below 160. But I don't think it's, I've never seen this be an issue for a home composter. And Linda, right. you should feel free to answer any of these questions too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, the systems are usually a little too small for that to happen. Um, but good to know that there is such a thing as too hot and usually turning um, or adding browns can, can help. Uh, yeah, bring the temperature back down. Uh, another question about cooked food in the compost, and would pasta or bread be a no-no? I could just say that in the a little bit is okay, but you don't want a pile full of just one or the other. What do you say, Brenda? Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, be careful about putting any human food in the pile, especially if you know you have active rodent infestations in your alley, in your neighborhood, very close by, um, because rats do like to eat human food. That's why we say no meat, no cooked food, no grease. So bread, if you are gonna put, like let's say we all have moldy bread or we bought some bread and it got hard as a rock, you know, a French loaf or something, and you wanna compost it, I would say just wet it, because if it's wet, you know, the bread is gonna decompose and break down very quickly in your pile. And as if you like put a whole loaf that was really hard in. So, you know, there are tricks you can do like that, but a little bit of bread, you know, don't go to your nearby bakery and get a whole bunch of bread and put it in, but a little bit is gonna be okay and make sure it's in the middle of your pile. And one thing we're gonna go through is never leave food scraps uncovered. So that's really important. Okay, another question. And shredded up cardboard act as a brown. I'd say yes, if it's not wax. Sometimes you have to be careful about the glues and things like that, but in a pinch, I think cardboard can work. It also, again, you don't want it layering and getting uh, like anaerobic because of that. And ideally it's not the only brown. What do you say, Brenda? That's right, yeah, shred it. I would say also in addition to the wax, some cardboard can be coated with a thin um, layer of uh, film plastic. So, you know, it used to be our, our um, you know, our milk cartons were wax coated, but they're plastic coated. And so just, you know, again, when in doubt, leave it out. And if you're just starting out, I would say, you know, get a feel for the process before you add things that, mm, maybe I wanna try this. Like you can experiment with composting. It's a very forgiving process and it's easy, fairly easy to troubleshoot. So, you know, go with the, more common materials, the leaves, the straw, the wood chips, the fresh fruit and vegetable scraps before you move to more challenging question mark materials. So get a feel for the process food first. We do have a question about uh, how do you know when your compost is done? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And then there's a question about troubleshooting. We'll talk about that also. Um, I see uh, this one about the winter. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I think some of you actually, there were a couple of you who, who um, had the 
winter question about when composting when it's cold out. So one thing that's great about composting is the heat from the pile comes from the microbes consuming the material and giving off energy in the form of heat. So the, the heat in the pile doesn't come from the sun, doesn't come from the summer, warm outdoor ambient temperatures. For sure, winter can help slow things down. Um, because it can make the pile, you know, cooler, which is one of the reasons why we recommend getting a system that has a big enough volume. The other ingredient for success is you, you can't just have a small little pile, nothing's going to happen. You need to get at least three feet by three feet by three feet, you know, volume in order for it to heat up and be somewhat insulated. So in the, in the winter, you know, I might give a little bit more nitrogen, kind of break things down, kind of adjust my recipe. Um, if I know there's a deep freeze coming, like what was that four years ago, the Potomac River froze like that. We knew that was a deep freeze, right? When the rivers are freezing, you know, I might get an old blanket I got at a thrift store and, and throw it over to help insulate my bin. But generally I don't worry about it. Things may slow down, but you can compost year round. And we have a lovely video. I'll make a note to send it to you guys. You can watch it. It's of these guys in, um, and gals and uh, folks in Vermont that have an outdoor hot tub and they've run some coils through their compost pile with the water going through it. And just running the coil through the compost pile, it comes out hot in the winter and they're uh, hot water enough to, for an outdoor hot tub. It's really funny, but it gets the point across that yes, you can compost in the winter um, and have a hot pile. Mm -hmm. It's a great uh, video to watch for sure. Um, there's a question about rats, avoiding rats, and I will just say that we will definitely address that here shortly. So I think we're caught up on questions. Okay. Uh, we have actually, a question that, oh, that the slides will be provided. Yes, you will get a copy of all the slides as well as a link to the recording of this webinar um, with us talking with the slides. Uh-huh. And, okay. So okay. There so a few questions that have come in now. Uh, all right. Well, so, let's keep going because we might cover stuff and we'll try to circle back. If we missed your question, put it in again. We'll try to go through it again. So, sorry, Linda, took over your section. <laughs> thank you for doing that. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> this is why we have two people always doing these workshops. So, uh, redundancy is good. All right. So, now what we're going to do is I'm going to go through some basic supplies for home composting, cover health and safety, how to get started preparing your materials, and filling your bin, and then we'll answer the questions on the rodents, a little troubleshooting, okay? So basic supplies, um, you, as I said, you don't need a temperature pro, but it's a great tool, So, and you can get one retail, $50, sometimes under their running sales. Um, you, you, you know, you, you're gonna need a source of water that's gonna help, um, so a garden hose with a spray no nozzle is, is a great idea. How are you going to collect your food scraps? Uh, we'll go through that in a little bit. Gloves are, I, I use gloves when I go out. I mean, if you're a gardener who likes to wear gloves, you're probably going to want to work, wear gloves when you're composting. You know, if you're going out at night, I mean, I wear a headlamp to actually, because I'm taking, sometimes I'm going out at dark, but I always wear gloves because, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, there's there's some critters there. I like to know what I'm putting my hand in. Um, not, I don't mean critters as in rodents or raccoons. I mean, you know, um, other other things in there that are good. Uh, cutting, you know, tomato plants or that, um, you know, cutting a vine shares a garden shares are good. How are you going to empty your compost? Then when, when you have compost to harvest, do you need a bucket? Do you need a wheelbarrow? You don't need a wheelbarrow, but you're going to think about things you might need because in the end, you're going to get this black gold. You're going to need to do something with it. If you have a stationary system, a pitchfork is going to be one of your best friends. Um, and if you already have a pitchfork, it'll work fine. If you're going to go out and get one, get a compost or manure fork. They have more scooped tines and pointed, so it's just a little better for composting. Uh, Face mask. Why do we have face masks here? We would bring to our in-person workshops N95 mask and make them available to our participants. Now we all have masks, so there's no reason not to um, to um, have a mask. And let me just say that why do we have masks on the list? Because as you're turning a pile or maybe you're screening your compost, you could have airborne fungal spores. 
or what's known in the industry as bioaerosols. So remember, there's fungus in here, there's bacteria. There's a particular one that's of concern because one in 10 uh, people, I understand, are allergic to it, and that's Aspergillus fumigatus. And it lives not just in compost, but in a pile of rotting leaves, or it could live in soil. So if you have um, asthma or respiratory issue or cystic fibrosis, and you're a gardener, you may, and your soil's dry and becoming airborne, you may want to wear a mask. So just something to, to keep in mind that we recommend. And I'm short, so whenever I'm turning my pile or sifting compost, I like to cover my face. And then the other stuff on health and safety is, you know, if you have a wound, protect it. You know, be careful about hand, um, hand to mouth contact. It is rotting food and microorganisms living here. So just, just follow basic sense guys. All right, so here's the common steps in the home composting process. So you're going to want to cut large materials as needed. So that could be like broccoli stalks, you know, it's tough. Give, give those microbes more surface area. You're going to um, mix your materials, build your compost pile regardless of what system you're using. You're going to track how things are going. So you, again, you don't need the temperature probe. I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record tonight. But um, but you'll know if it's hot. You'll know if it smells, if things are breaking down. You'll do the moisture test. So you know, troubleshoot is needed. You're going to need to let it cure and stabilize and mature. Sifting is optional. If you're just using fall leaves, which I did for many years, I never sifted my compost. If you are getting started now and there's no fall leaves so you're looking at using wood chips and more twigs that's not all going to break down so you're going to want to sift that out if you have also a lot of corn cobs or mango pits or avocado pits um peach pits now are in season right you might want to sift it out and we'll show you some pictures of some easy sifters and screens you can make and i don't actually sift i actually let my compost cure and I sift it before using so I don't need to think about a place to let it cure and a place to store my finished compost. I just dispense with one of those altogether. But preparing your material size does matter. You don't really have to chop everything but things will speed up if you give those microbes more surface area. So if you don't want to break your corn, you know, you can break a corn cob in half with your hands but if you don't want to get the big knife out and chop it into four pieces like shown here, it's fine it'll go eventually just keep throwing it back in your pile and while you have like you squeezed a lemon or an orange you know while you have it on your chopping block and your knife's out just chop it again and throw it in your in your bin um, so we move those proto stickers this is my own family as, much, as hard as I try to tell them to remove the proto stickers before they put it in the food scrap bin I'm still picking them out at the end of the process so there's some eggshells here it looks like I don't know, butternut squash seeds. Man don't try to cut the mango pits or the avocado pits. You'll just hurt yourself. And I showed this here, like this is a mango pit. It'll it'll disappear, and so will the avocado pit. Here's some wood. But, you know, you can put all this stuff back in, but the proto stickers, you know, take out the contaminants, throw them away. Oops, okay, so kitchen pail. How are you going to collect your food scraps in your kitchen? You have lots of options here, too. These are cheap, these, you know, fairly cheap, 10 to 12, $15. These, they sell these plastic um, kitchen caddies. Um, I find that they absorb the odor over time, so I prefer a metal pail. Ceramic is good too, but it's heavier. But, you know, you don't need to buy something. You can use a three gallon bucket or an old pot or go to a thrift store and find something. I do find it's helpful to have a lid. And I would advise against getting too big of a bucket. I find that if I have a five gallon bucket, I don't empty it as frequently and that nitrogen rich material will start to release the liquid and break down and get smelly before it's even gotten to the compost pile. And one of the great things about home composting is you can add the fresh feedstocks with your carbon, you know, more frequently because you're doing it at home. And so there's no reason to let it get all smelly so um, and liquid. So a smaller kitchen pail can be um, a benefit. So this is uh, the pail I use in my kitchen. It weighs about two pounds and on this scale it's showing about seven and a quarter pounds. So that's, that's about five pounds when full. I probably empty it twice, three times a week depending on how much cooking I'm doing. Um, but this is over a few days. There's cilantro stems, pear cores, tea bag, eggshells, garlic peels, avocados, more bananas, 
Taco Tuesdays, I think. We got the limes and the red onions. Citrus is fine. Banana peels. Pistachio shells, they'll break down. Put the pistachio shells right in there. Strawberry tops. Coffee, we generate a quarter pound of coffee grounds every day in my house. But we drink a lot of tea, too. Um, if you're getting tea bags, you can put the paper and the string in. But if you have staples, just rip them off because you don't want it in your backyard, right? So anything you don't want in your yard, don't put it in the bin. Um, or buy tea that doesn't have staples, but the string's fine. Um, so now your, your, your fruit scrap pail is full. You're going to go out to your backyard. Um, you're gonna, this is the system uh, that I had set up when I took this picture. I'm using a different system now, but one of these stationary systems. So I'm going to come up. I'm going to put my fruit scraps in here, but I have my browns ready to go in this other kind of corralled. So the browns you can store. That's Think of browns as material that's more woody that doesn't rot as easily, whereas grass clippings or fruit scraps you know, are going to release their liquid and more nitrogen rich and start to rot. So you can't store nitrogen rich materials, but you need to have your supply of carbon ready to go. And so when the fall, the leaves start falling, you're going to want to keep all of those all year round. Um, and getting started, I kind of covered this, but it's kind of go over some of the basics. So you're, once you select your bin, and we're going to go through the different options you have, there's so many um, when we get to the rebate, but um, you're going to select your bin and where are you going to put it? So a lot of people think of putting it right up against a fence or, you know, out of the way, but really you want space around the bin for you to work, for you to get in there and, and pitch fork or empty. But also rodents do not like open space. They like things against walls. They travel along walls and fences. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But having room around the compost bin is, is, is a number one, one of our top tips for how to avoid rodent issues. So set up your browns. You want to have your tools accessible. If you have a stationary system, you can keep your temperature probe if you have one right in there. Otherwise, where are you going to keep it? Um, when you're first building your pile, think about how that chimney effect we talked about. It's going to draw cold air from the bottom and the sides and up through the top. So you want to start with this base, four to six inch base of more looser browns, twigs, wood chips, you know, plant cuttings. And, you know, leaves are fine there too, but that's going to be at the bottom to create that airy kind of campfire analogy you know, that, that we're trying to emulate to get the airflow through the pile. Then you're going to add, um, build your pile, browns and greens. We'll go through some examples in a few minutes. Air rate is needed. Check the earliest you can have compost is 8 to 12 weeks. And then you can harvest from the bottom here if you have one of these systems or in a batch system um, or in a multi-bin system from one of the sections of your multi-bin. And um, when your bin is full and ready to be emptied, you, if you have space, you can move it and start a new pile, keep it where it is. So here's some options for filling your bin. So this is for a stationary bin. You may have heard of this. It's called lasagna layering. So you're going to add those kind of more open twigs, that air pockets at the, the, the bottom. Um, you're going to add four to six inches of browns. That's going to help if you have two liquidy food scraps. It's going to help absorb the liquid and not have it run out of your bin. Um, but then you're going to add your greens and you're going to kind of make a lasagna. You're just going to layer and layer. And you never want to have um, any exposed food. So you're always going to want to cover and um, the food scraps. And this is a tip for avoiding flies. You know, flies are not terrible in a compost pile, but nobody wants to go in and be assaulted with fruit flies in your face or see maggots. It's kind of a yuck factor. So this, and, and also having food scraps on top can attract other unwanted visitors, those rodents, raccoons, possums. So the carbon on top acts like a biofilter, keeping the smells in too that would attract um, critters that you don't want in there. Okay, and and as you're building a pile, you want to moist. You know, if it's not wet enough, then you can get that hose with the spray no nozzle and spray as you go. Um, it's not gonna. It may not start heating up until you have enough volume. One and two, until you mix the greens with the browns. So you're flipping your pile, or 
or mixing it because it's really that recipe that gives those microbes the ideal balance of carbon to nitrogen that they need to thrive. So lasagna lay layering works, but I prefer kind of mixing as you go. I think it speeds things up. So, you know, this time of year in September, October, when we have leaves, you can get your bin now, take advantage of the rebate, right? And, um, and then you can start now with straw, wood chips, maybe some shredded paper, some yard trimmings that you might have on hand if you don't have any leaves. Um, but then in the fall, you know, get a bin, fill it up with the right moisture, come in and you make kind of like a little hole or a nest in the center, and then you add your food scraps and then you cover. And the next time you come, you know, maybe you don't want to add the fruit scraps here, you make a nest over here on the left or the right or some other place, or you come in and you mix it first, so you don't get this pocket of fruit scraps in the middle that starts to rot and smell. You want to just kind of mix it, and what I'm showing here is a picture of what this might look like, where you're coming back, it's moist, you see how it's kind of a darker brown, it's beginning to break down, and then you're mixing it, and then you're making another pocket and putting the food scraps in. And then before I walk away, I've covered it with, with leaves on top. So there's this shows a pitchfork. You can get these compost turners. You know, you can pay more money for them. I know lots of people swear by them. I've never had one, or maybe I had one. I never really used it. I like my pitch. I personally like my pitchfork. Um, but this is another schematic of what we're aiming for, where you've got that base of carbon. You've got enough volume of the greens and browns, you've you've created this biofilter, bio cover. It's kind of a dome shape. A lot of these bins are dome shaped because they're taking advantage of how the heat rises through this this kind of dome shape. So no food scraps visible. That's what you're aiming for. All right. Some of you are going to want tumblers because of rodent issues or just keeping it more on enclosed. A um, couple of things to note with tumblers. I think they're a little harder to get the oxygen in. And even though almost all the um, tumblers, sorry, it's just jumpy when I go to one screen to another, even though they come with these holes in them, um, the holes can get clogged. So really it's when you're opening the bin and you, you may not have a pitchfork, but maybe there's a trowel or something else you can use to kind of get things mixing with the air coming in. Take advantage when you open it to do that. But here, if you're getting started, you put some browns in at the right moisture level, you add some greens, but not, you know, you want there to be twice as much browns always than your greens. Then you're gonna close it, you're gonna tumble. Um, and then you can open it and cover, if there's any food scraps sticking out, you can cover with some browns to cover those exposed food scraps so that it's a tip for how to avoid attracting flies. And then, and then don't turn it again you know, close it and walk away. So that's just one tip. And that, that has helped people to avoid the, the flies getting in. Um, again, flies are not terrible, but they're just kind of more of a nuisance for us. And then remember your hand squeeze test on a few drops. Um, all right, let me just say a word about rodents. Um, so uh, rodents, as I think we know, can carry diseases. Um, there's a number of them, but the ones we're most familiar with are hunter virus and leptospirosis, which is a rare bacterial infection, but it is spread through their urine. <clears throat> so, um, and, uh, you know, I don't really know of any leptospirosis through compost, you know, that's happened through rodents and compost piles, but, um, but it, it, it can happen. And so it's always, you want a, we definitely want to avoid rodents uh, making a hotel out of your compost pile and, and also um, thriving. One, the type of rat that lives in, our, in DC is a Norway rat. And one healthy female Norway rat can have 84 offspring in one year. Now the rats that are living outside, they're generally um, having offspring in the spring and the, in the fall. Um, not in the winter, but if they're living inside, they can be um, propagating, uh, having offspring all year round. But that's that's exponential growth. So if you have rodent issues in your neighborhood, in your alley, you do want to beat those back um, and not let them thrive. So you may want to get with your neighbors anyway. But rats tend to, from where their burrow is, they tend to feed within a hundred feet radius. So if you've got an open dumpster or restaurant nearby, 
um, you just know that's a that's an open buffet for them, right? Or a, a public trash can. So you want to be try to be further than a hundred feet from known boroughs if you if you can. These are nine tips that we put together to help avoid rodent problems. So number one, do not give them the food that they like to eat. They um, really do thrive better on a balanced diet that includes protein. It's harder for them to survive on just fruit and vegetable scraps. So if you're just composting fruit and vegetable scraps with the carbon and you're not giving them the meat and the dairies and the cooked food, you're one step ahead of the game here in this war against the rodents. Then you want to incorporate all of those food scraps that you are putting in there very well into the pile and then the step three is you want to cover it with the carbon, nice thick layer acting as a biofilter. And then that space. Rodents don't, you know, think like a hawk. You know, rodents don't like hawks or predators. So that's why they, they love clutter. They travel along the wall. So if you have to, you know, do the best you can. I know a lot of you have some very small spaces, but try not to put your compost bin right up against a wall or a fence. The same with your trash can and recycling bins, by the way. A lot of those end up kind of clutter. So have space around there and the rats will be less interested in your bin and go to somebody else's that's got more clutter. And even if you don't home compost, you may want to uh, think about these tips, you know, um, shrubbery that creates hiding places and things like that. Activity is good. This is another area where being an active composter is such a plus because rodents like undisturbed areas and piles. So if you're an active composter, even in your carbon, your leaf pile, like get your pitchfork in there and make sure that you know every now and then you're um, having some activity there too. If you have a stationary system, they can work well in DC. Um, uh, they're, they, most of them come open to the soil and they come with stakes. You can stake them right to the ground. Not all of them stake, but you can get um, hardware cloth. We recommend quarter inch galvanized steel hardware cloth from your local hardware store. And that's kind of like a metal mesh. And you can put that underneath your bin and quarter inch, one, a half inch will keep out rats and a quarter inch will keep out uh, mice too. But anyway, activity is good. Moving your system is good. Um, and I'll just show you, this is what that hardware cloth looks like. Um, it's uh, staked out. You can just get tent stakes from REI or somewhere and stake it out. But um, that's just an extra barrier. Some of these systems come with bases, like for an extra $10. So you can buy the plastic base. But rats have these, um, these teeth. They're like knives. And they uh, can cut through plastic and cut through wood. Um, but they have a harder time through through steel and metal. So even if you get a plastic base, we you could avoid the plastic base cost and just get the hardware cloth. So we recommend uh, doing that underneath. All right, avoiding odor. So again, prompt handling of food scraps, mixing it with your carbon. Uh, you don't want you put your bin in standing water. Um, that also, if it's if it's an area where it rains and it gets pools that'll that'll prevent the air from coming in it kind of so you want that airflow so you don't really want standing water that can attract mosquitoes so you want it good drainage um, meat cooked food dairy fish all contribute to odors which is one of the reasons it does attract rodents so you don't want that be a good neighbor have your browns on hand at all times so um, Linda I'm gonna hand it to Linda in a minute maybe we're gonna pause for questions here on when you know your compost is finished but let me just cover some common problems with with um, composting maybe some of you have experienced this it's bad odor what are you thinking what are you going to do maybe it's too much nitrogen right need more carbon or maybe there's it's gone anaerobic and you need oxygen all right the center of your pile is dry it's not heating up well maybe do the moisture test moisture and turn your pile remember if it gets hot you're driving off the moisture so you may need to water Let's say your pile's got enough moisture, but it's still not heating up as much as you would like. Well, maybe it's too small. Maybe you need to build it up, collect more material. Um, and if it's still, you have enough volume, maybe you just don't have enough nitrogen. So one good um, starter for a pile is like coffee grounds are high in nitrogen, but they're a small surface area or grass clippings. If you have a source of that, it can help jumpstart a pile to get it going. And I think we'll we'll pause there to see if we have more questions, and then again we're going to get into how to know, when you know your compost is ready. 
Yes. So, so Linda, we have... got, you, got you stuck doing the questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. I appreciate you jumping in uh, to cover for me. So we had a number of questions about brown materials uh, and where to get browns if you don't have a big yard. I put something, I think I put something in the chat uh, to reply to everybody that uh, shredded newspaper is great. I used to collect newspapers from the metro um, because I didn't always have access to browns in my garden either. Um, but then the D DC Urban Garden Network also has a list of tree service providers that might be willing to uh, part with some of their wood chips, the shredded wood. Uh, Brenda, I don't know if you have any other suggestions for sources of brown. Yeah, you can get um, you can get a, a, a bale of straw mm -hmm. um, right. from a local landscape and gardening hardware store. Um, you know, the straw. I wouldn't. I would say it might be challenging to just have straw be your only carbon source because what is it when it's kind of water phobic? You know, you can imagine straw like doesn't absorb water so well. So you need it to begin to break down a little bit. Um, so a, a straw mixed with some wood chips, some other browns, paper, maybe a little bit shredded paper. You cannot compost with just paper though. It's going to be too dense and be this like mush. I think. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be challenging just to do it with paper. Yeah, maybe make some friends uh, with the garden or uh, go out to the countryside and get some straw. You can get it cheaper there. Um, uh, it also gets at a question about uh, somebody asked if you're storing browns and it gets wet, if that's a bad thing, if it starts to like break down on its own. And I think that it actually can be a good thing um, or it doesn't have to be a bad thing because um, it can actually add moisture to your pile, um, but it could also add potentially too much moisture. Um, what do you think, Brenda? I like, ha I have my leaves, um, you know, exposed to the elements. Um, I think it helps it break down and get the moisture in and then I'm watering less, so I kind of like it. But again, like that picture we showed of the matted leaves, so if you're doing that and it gets matted, you have to kind of, you know, break it apart a little bit, flush mm -hmm. them up. But you know, and if you if you you don't have your own source of leaves even in the fall, you know, people are putting out bags of leaves. And one trick is like if there's a if there's not a fence around the yard at all, then I think they don't have a dog. <laughs> you know, it's because you don't want to be picking up dog poop either, right? In somebody else's leaves, but you know, generally, so you can just think about like if I'm picking up this this you know neighbors or friends, you know, it's a there, if there's no fence, that kind of tells you maybe they don't have a dog. Keep, mm -hmm. keep things like that in mind. Um, there's a question. Uh, gave some tips for avoiding rodents, but this person has raccoons, possums, groundhogs. Uh, any suggestions for avoiding them? And I would say just the odor reduction or avoiding odors is always good. The activity is going to be good. Yeah, and avoid the same things. It's like don't put the meat in the odiferous, if that's a word, materials mm -hmm. in your pile. And you know, going the the rebate, which we'll talk about, only applies to enclosed systems. So DC Public Works is not encouraging open compost systems. So that's going to help you with with other unwanted critters like possums and raccoons as well. If you have an enclosed system, so those those state the, the the systems that the rebate applies to are also going to keep out other critters for sure. And we'll show you some pic we'll show you some do it yourself pictures too. Um, now, somebody said, can your pile get too wet, Linda? Did you, ad did we address that one? Uh, no, I don't think, I don't yeah. think we addressed it yet. So, so it you, can, your mm -hmm. pile can get too wet. You can, you know, so just add more dry material, you know, because the water will fill the air pockets. Um, mm -hmm. If your food has rotted, should it not go in the pile? Linda, you want to take that? That's exactly the type, yeah, that's the, exactly the type of stuff you would like. Well, you know, it's going to do that in the compost pile. So it's sort of pre-composting uh, in your fridge or wherever that might be happening. So yes, absolutely. Uh, moldy food can go in the compost and it will do its thing there. Right. Moldy strawberry tops, potatoes, onions, cantaloupe, whatever it is, put that in there. So again, if it's your moldy meat, no. But um uh, the other thing I'll just say is we've got it wasn't you didn't ask this but um, uh, but some people freeze their food scraps 
and that is actually fine. The the freezing the 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 um you know when it freezes it kind of gets bigger, right? Um, and it breaks the cell walls. So putting the frozen when you first go into the pile and you put it in, you know, you don't even have to break it up. You can put it in as a frozen clump, cover it. The next time you go, make sure you mix it with the browns when it's, you know, not frozen anymore. So you're not getting this nitrogenous pocket in the middle of your pile. But freezing food scraps is fine too. Yeah, definitely. Right. It, it's nice uh, for keeping stuff off of your counter. And I'll just say that with the, can your piles get too wet? Uh, it's another good reason to have a covered uh, system just because then you can control the moisture. Uh, but if you your pile does get too wet, you can always add more carbon, like Brenda said. All right. If you are using a rotating drum, how do you keep the lasagna layers? I'll ask some questions so you can answer. <laughs> nice. Okay. I like this. Um, so uh, I don't know if this is clear at this point. I think this question was asked a little bit a, a little while ago, but uh, you definitely don't need to keep the a lasagna layers, uh, whether it's in the tumbler or in your static system, uh, what you do, you do, it's a good thing to mix everything together because um, it's when everything gets kind of mixed together that the microbes get access to all the things that they're going to need, both the carbon and the nitrogen and the moisture um, and the air fluffing benefits of mixing. Uh, but what you do want to make sure after you mix is that you're covering everything with a layer of browns, like Brenda mentioned, so that you're keeping you know it helps just keep uh flies down and it helps you know seal up any potential odors yep all right here's one last question then we're going to move on because we want to get to the rebate how long can you keep adding fresh greens browns before you need to let the pile cure that's like the sixty thousand dollar question linda hmm so uh Sorry, the question was how many weeks? How long we can you keep, you know, how long do you keep adding fresh material before you have to like stop and let it cure? That's, I mean, uh, I think your system will determine how long you can add. Uh, sometimes you have to, if you fill up your system, uh, then you're going to have to stop. And that's a good time to let the composting process happen. Or if it's a system where there's uh, compost ready to be harvested from the bottom, which we'll talk about in just a second, you can remove that and rebuild your pile with the stuff that hasn't broken down yet. Um, but you definitely, and we'll talk about curing in just a moment, but that's a super important step. Um, so I don't know, we'll get into that in just a second. Is there anything you want to say about that right now, Brenda? No, I'll when I show you some systems. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But yeah, it always is, it depends. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you active composter, you passive composter. Is your bin full? You know, if it's full, maybe you need to let it cure and stop adding. You know, yeah. so there's some common sense things that as you get into the flow of this, you'll figure it out yourself. But just remember, it's a forgiving, flexible process. All right, one last question. I said I might have said this before, but uh, we got one more. If you travel, travel and can't add or rotate for six to eight weeks, will that create problems? Well, it is a good time, good to make sure that you have enough browns. Um, you want to err on the side of browns, um, just and making sure you're enclosed in that layer of browns. Um, but no, uh, your your composting system will will forgive you when you get home, and you can kind of jumpstart the process again, maybe with like uh, a little bit of water, a little turning if you really need to, then maybe some um, coffee grounds like Brenda mentioned earlier. So it will forgive you. All right. I say we keep going. We'll keep the questions coming. We'll we'll circle back to those. All right. So Mike is yours. I think keep your webcam off. And if you freeze yeah. again, I'll just jump in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to test the internet, God, so I will leave my video off. Sorry, everyone. Um, I'll try to pop on uh, again at the end. But so to the question about um, how long or, you know, when do we know that compost is ready to cure? Um, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, so we're going to talk about wrapping up the composting process. Uh, so now now that we've talked about how the composting process goes, uh, let's assume we're at the point where we have some stuff to, to harvest. Um, you see here a picture of a free garden earth. It's a stationary system. Uh, both Brenda and I use this system at home, and it has this door uh, that you can remove from the bottom uh, 
from which you can harvest that nice looking finished compost that you see in the picture. Um, so you can open the door to harvest, or sometimes it's better to lift the whole bin up and reset it in a new spot next to the old one. Um, that's what I like to do, and you transfer basically, you'll, when you take the cover off the system, when you move it over, uh, you'll take your hardware cloth um, uh, bottom and move that over too, um, if you're using one, and then you'll lift the system over, and when you lift the system off, you'll see like layers like a cake, um, and you'll definitely see where the compost is nice and dark and looks um, like you can't see any food scraps, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the stuff that you want to get to. The stuff on top, um, you'll see probably recognizable food scraps. That's the stuff you're going to move over and you're going to rebuild your base of twigs, um, like Brenda talked about earlier, and start all over again. Um, but there are several indicators that tell you when your compost is finished. Here are some of them. Um, it'll have a nice dark brown color. It'll be crumbly, loose. Um, and you should not be able to recognize any of the materials you put in to s at the start, uh, with the exception of coarse woody materials like twigs and sticks. These will persist uh, through the composting process most likely, but those can be sifted out and added into new batches of compost. Um, the pile will have shrunk to about a third of its original volume. Uh, commercial composting facilities are required to test all of their finished compost at a lab, but when you're composting at home, there are two basic tests that you can do uh, to test your compost to see if it's ready for use or if the composting process is done. Uh, the first is a seed germination test. So basically you'll take um, a pack of seeds. Um, sometimes they have a germination rate uh, printed on the packet. Sometimes you have to look it up online. Uh, but you'll take some seeds um, and you'll then take a, a plate and put a sample of your compost on it. Um, count out 100, 100 seeds and place them throughout the compost and then uh, moisten it um, and you're going to keep it for a few days, keep moistening it and then after a few days you'll check how many seeds have sprouted and compare it to the germination rate. So if you have a 95% germination rate that should be expected from those seeds, you should ideally be seeing something like 95 seeds sprouting. So if you have good germination, that's a sign that your uh, compost is providing a good growing environment for those seeds. All right, so the next test uh, is the respiration test. Um, and here you take a sample of your compost that you think is done. Uh, you put it in a Ziploc bag, you press out any air and seal it, and then you store it out of the sun somewhere for three days. Uh, after three days, you open it and put it up to your nose and smell it. So you want to kind of get the first uh, whiff of what's in the bag. And if you smell ammonia, that is a sign that it needs more time and the composting process is not done. All right, so uh, we've had multiple questions from workshop participants on how to store finished compost. Um, and here in the, these pictures, you can see some options, uh, which can also work for storing your browns or your finished compost, yeah. So a perforated metal trash can, a wire mesh container, uh, the yellow plastic bins here are used for storing fall leaves in this situation, um, but they are food grade. Okay, and then remember that this fall, uh, fall is coming and it's time to take advantage of catching or getting those fall leaves and stocking up because you will use all of those leaves throughout the year. Um, and so using some of these systems to store some leaves uh, will set you up for the year. Okay, one thing you might notice in your finished compost is that things like avocado pits or mango seeds are not fully broken, broken down. That's totally fine. And all those chunkier things that remain, uh, things that remain including twigs or wood chips can be screened out. Here you see an example of a really simple screener with a quarter inch hardware fabric and some duct, duct tape around it to uh, protect your fingers. Um, and it fits right over the a five gallon bucket. You can see Brenda there uh, sifting her compost, showing off some of her nice black gold. Um, and then here you can see uh, some of the bigger pits being screened out. I think that was in the previous picture, maybe. No, there's the pits, okay. Uh, a common question is whether you can compost pits. And yes, the answer is yes. Mango pits, avocado pits, they will break down eventually. Um, you just keep sifting them out like this and putting them back in your next pile. All right, 
So here is a homemade screener that fits right over a wheelbarrow. If you're screening more compost for application in your garden, uh, this might be more efficient way to screen. But the concept is the same. Um, so here is a picture of that beautiful screen, black gold, ready to be tipped into your garden. Um, you can see that it has a beautiful crumbly consistent texture and then it's rich and black in color. And that's what we're looking for for finished compost. Alrighty, so using finished compost. Um, in the germination test we just talked about, we planted in 100% compost, but when you're using compost in your garden or potted plants, you don't need more than 20 to 30% by volume of the soil blend to be compost. Uh, here we lay out a few examples of how you can use your finished compost. Um, one of the most popular is incorporating into your soil. Uh, you can um, mix into your garden bed prior to seeding or transplanting plants, uh, add a couple of inches into the soil and mix into the kind of plant root zone. Uh, but when you're using compost uh, in this way, it should be fully mature. Uh, so fully stable, cured. Another way to use compost is as a mulch, and this is a good way uh, to use compost that's not fully mature, so if you have any doubts about it. Um, since if you use unfinished compost in soil, it basically uh, attempts to continue the composting process and removes nitrogen from the soil so that it can finish the composting process, which steals, it, steals the nitrogen from plants. So to use it as mulch, you'll pull up sod around your plants, add a layer of your compost a few inches deep, and make sure not to touch, uh, make sure the compost is not touching the stem of the plant or any tree trunks. Uh, okay, but that'll be, those will be in your handout so you can look up more details about the potting mix. So now we're gonna go do some polling questions to see how, uh, how y'all have been in taking this information in. All right, so. Linda, I'll run them, okay? Okay. All right. All right, so first question, what items should you leave out of your backyard compost bin? Select all that apply. Uh, weeds, meat and dairy, moldy kitchen scraps, dog and cat waste, vacuum dirt. Again, selecting all that apply. a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to close the poll and show the results. All righty. So weeds are definitely up to you. If you don't want it in your garden, it's probably good to leave it out. Meat and dairy definitely should be leaving out, um, or we recommend leaving out. Moldy kitchen scraps, again, those are good to, those are okay to go in the compost because they are they're pretty, pretty much like pre-composting um, by molding. Uh, dog and cat waste, definitely good to keep out. And vacuum dirt, we recommend keeping out just because uh, there can be, uh, you know, lots of things on our floors uh, from, you know, our shoes of walking around uh, lead and things like that. So we recommend uh, leaving vacuum dirt out. Alrighty, next question. What are the secrets to good composting? Again, selecting all that apply. Sunlight, oxygen, moisture, balance of carbon rich materials to nitrogen rich materials, and a shredder for fall leaves. Which of these items, these things do you need for good compost? All right, All right cool. I'm going to close the poll and show the results. All righty. Oxygen, moisture, and a balance of carbon-rich materials to nitrogen-rich materials are our winners. Sunlight is not needed for good composting. It's actually, especially in D.C. and other hot environments, it's, it, it's good to consider keeping your compost out of the sun because uh, things could potentially get too hot if it's like a black plastic system out in the sun on a hot day. Um, and a shredder for leaves is definitely not needed at the home scale. Uh, you can compost very well without shredding your leaves.
All right, next question. What are key strategies to avoid rodent problems? Select all that apply. Mix all bits of food into your pile and never leave any exposed. Activity and periodically moving your system. Avoiding composting meat, fish, dairy, and other protein. Using a rat-resistant fully enclosed compost bin. And three-foot clearance around bin with no clutter. What do you need to avoid rodents? All right, I'm going to close the poll and show the results. So this is sort of a trick question because all of the answers are correct. Um, but the avoiding, compo avoiding meat, fish, dairy, and protein and the rat resistance system are clear winners here. Uh, but all of these things, all of these practices will help. All right, so we have a couple more polls at the end just to see how well we've done. But I think, where are we? I think now it's back to me, Linda, right? Um, kind of wrap up on the yep. how do you choose which system and then the rebate. So for those of you who aren't interested in the rebate, we'll have some time also for Q to answer more Q&A, but we're just going to go through um, what the rebate up to $75 will co cover. And so first thing you may ask, how do I choose? And I hate to tell you it depends, but it does. So do you have a big yard? Do you have a lot of trees? Do you have a lot of yard trimmings? Are you an active gardener? Are you with a big household, multi-families in your household? Maybe you need a bigger system with a lot more volume. Um, uh, do you have, which, you know, some of these, we'll show you pictures of some of these, um, some photographs. Um, if you ha are in a neighborhood with active rat infestation, again, you know, composters often get blamed. Oh, you're going to compost, you're going to attract rodents. Well, folks, the rodents are here in D.C. We are giving them open buffets with dumpsters and overflowing trash cans and things that are not rodent resistant or rodent proof at all. So when we begin to corral our food scraps in these systems, we're actually uh, preventing them access to the food waste. And that's what you need to do. You want to prevent, deny them access deni to the food. You want to deny them security. That's the habitat. Um, and you want to, so these are things to think about. So then the tumbler above ground could be a good idea. And some of these tumblers, even stationary systems, you can get metal systems that they can't even chew through. So these are just some options. So now what I want to do is show you just some some pictures. So wire wire bins have been around um, forever. They're a very low cost option. Again, the rebate is not going to cover these, but you know if you're in an area with no rat pressure and you have a lot of yard trimmings, you could be composting in, in something like this, especially your yard trimmings. Um, if you're going to be doing food scraps, we do recommend something more enclosed. In addition to like the chicken wire that was shown, these kind of plastic sheets with holes, you can kind of control the size of the radius, the geo bins. Actually, Montgomery County, Maryland, this is what they give away for free for yard waste comp composting in that county. I think these are very good for storing leaves and carbon. Um, but uh, wooden pallets, repurposing wooden pallets. People have been doing this for a long, long time. And um, they're great because, you know, you can kind of build a big pile. You can create these bays or bin systems. So while one's full, you can, you know, start another one or you can let it cure here. But they're open. So they're not they're not so great for DC. I've seen designs that they're fully enclosed with hardware cloth, that quarter inch galvanized steel hardware cloth. So if you're handy and creative, you could design something that's fully enclosed and have the hardware cloth underneath. Um, this bin on the, the top right here, you know, is actually taking repurposed wooden pallets and making something that's kind of, for, you know, enclosed. So um, you can really let your, you know, tap your imagination and innovation here. The three bin systems, I love these. I've used these for so many years, something like this. Because um, um, you can get enough volume and it's just so easy to, like I said, to start on bin one, flip to bin two, let it cure in bin three. Um, lots of designs available. You know, Some are more open, like this one on the top here. But there are designs that are fully enclosed. 
And one of the things that's nice about some of these designs where you see this hardware cloth, this is allowing the air into the bin, whereas the tumblers or the stationary systems that are, you know, full plastic can't get the air in there so easily. So this kind of, you know, these are all, these are open. And if so, if you can design something and cover it in hardware cloth, I think that could work really well. You just want to make sure the lid is fitting tightly all around, like shown kind of maybe in this one and the one on the right here. So um, just you know but again this could be used for storing browns or your finished compost so lots of lots of designs here the rebate does not cover do it yourself so if you're buying hardware cloth or you're buying lumber it, it, you cannot use the the rebate to cover those supplies at least not yet okay the rebate is only really um for off the shelf systems that you can buy and so the two basic types are stationary systems like this or the tumblers or rotating bins. So there are many stationary systems available. They come in different sizes. Most of them are made from recycled plastic. Um, some are made in the US, some are made in Canada, some are made elsewhere. Neither the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which is where Linda and I work for that nonprofit, nor the DC DPW, Department of Public Works, neither organization endorses any specific brand. And in fact, the reason the city set this up as a rebate is to give you choice. So if you wanted a, a thousand gallon stationary system like this one here, this one's 160 gallons, this is a thousand, these are like 80 down here gallons, you could decide how you want to use your rebate or if you want a tumbler or above ground. So you have choice, that's why they rolled it out this way. Um, do read the reviews. Some, um, the reviews are, don't read the reviews for tips on composting because there's so much misinformation on how to compost. You now know more than most of the people writing those reviews because they never took a two hour workshop. But, um, but the reviews would be like, are the clips good? Does it latch? How easy is it to put together? So the reviews can tell you a lot um, if, it's, if it lasts, if it's durable. But these will all be covered. Um, tumblers and barrel, barrels are good. I have heard that the barrels that turn on the vertical axis, when they're fully loaded, actually are really hard to turn. So it's work. So if you want work, you might want that. If you have physical limitations um, or that's an issue strength, you might want to go with the one that turns on the horizontal axis. Um, there's a big difference in size. Some of these are really small, but could be fun. This pink one is a small, one but it comes off the base and kids can roll it around the yard so if you have young kids and you want to engage them in the process you know maybe that would be a good match for your family i would say if you're going to get a tumbler do get one that the lid latches in some way or secures this hot frog one here with the green is just slides and it's a piece of plastic i i tested one of those and it just you know, I'll close it, I'll come back at it and it would have slid open. So um, um, some of you don't have a lot of, uh, you have very small yards, so there's some that are marked as porch composters, a little smaller. Um, some are designed for wheelbarrow to go underneath, so kind of the thinking about how easy it might be to empty. Um, these are batch systems meaning you have to finish a batch. It's a single chamber. At some point, you have to stop adding and let it finish. And so then what are you gonna do with the food scraps you have? Well, then you could go to maybe a dual chamber tumbler. And what these are designed is, it's got two sides now. So you can add to one side, when that's full and finishing, you can begin another batch on the other side. These cost more money. You know, you can get um, a stationary system for a fraction of the price as a tumbler, and when you go to dual chamber, it increases the cost. Now, some of these dual chambers, people have been buying these where they now, it's very small, it's like 47 gallons, and then each side together is less than, you know, 25 gallons, and it's going to be hard to get it hot. So if you're concerned about killing, the weed seeds, reaching that thermophilic temperature range, it's going to be hard in a small system. So you might want to opt for a bigger tumbler. The Jura is the one that we know. These are made out of metal. 
So again, more rat resistant and the drawer is insulated. We know a lot of people up in Vermont during the winters that are able to do hot composting in these, but more expensive. And I just wanna go back to the stationary systems again and just point out these are more like continuous flow where you can add to the top and harvest from the bottom. So you're, you don't need two of these unless you need more volume for the material you're generating. And I'm using a different system now, but when I was using the free garden earth, just, you know, we're a family of four and we cook a lot, especially during COVID. And we, had a, you know, I'm taking 13 pounds of food scraps from my kitchen, not even my carbon every week. And, um, I probably emptied it twice a year, maybe three times a year, because it's like magic. It kind of just gets smaller and smaller. So it's not, it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of work composting if you don't want to um, empty it. There's also do-it-yourself barrels. You can make your own. Um, this design here on the bottom right just shows how when they built it, they thought about turning it so it empties into a wheelbarrow. So that's just a consideration. Um, and I'm going to keep going, Linda, um, and talk about the rebate, so um, save some time here. But on the, the rebate, let me just explain for that program. It's run like the city's rain barrel, rain barrel program, so you have to have a $25 copay. So if you buy a system for $40, you put in $25, your rebate will be $15. If you buy a $100 system, you put in $25, you get $75. If you buy something that costs more than $100, you're maxed out at $75. Our nonprofit, Linda's and mine, are the ones that are uh, looking at your rebates application. So we will be the ones approving that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, our contract ends in literally three weeks. So if you want to apply for a rebate, please, please don't wait. Uh, we will process the rebate almost within a day or two and approve it. Um, we're processing them very quickly now, almost the same day we get them. Uh, but it takes time for the uh, accounting team to cut the check and even more time for the US Postal Service to mail it to you. And we've just got, it takes you some time to deposit it. And all the checks have to clear our account by September 9th or we won't get paid. We won't get reimbursed. So we're asking you please to get your rebate applications. We'll process them. And when you get your check, please don't wait to deposit it. You can, um, we, we're also asking, there's an address on the form. But if you could please email it, just take a picture with your phone, however, and email it to the DC home composting at ILSR.org email. It's going to also be quicker and save us time. Uh, Linda and I are working at home, so there's a delay when it gets mailed to our office before we ever get to see that. So, um, so because we're at the end of the contract, and this is the last workshop that we're doing under a three-year contract. So congratulations for getting in on this. Um, uh, we do need a full receipt, not like a screenshot. It's got to have the date on it. It's got to show that it's been paid in full, and it's got to show that it was a composting system. If you are supporting a local Home Depot or hardware store, we know your address won't be on the receipt because you went in in person, but if you're buying it online, we do like the address shipping to match the address that we're mailing the rebate to and your proof of residency. We are accepting a wide variety of things to prove that you're a DC resident. You don't have to be a US citizen, just live in DC. So we're getting photos of driver's license, the front, we're getting utility bills. Some people have given, given us the first page of their lease or even their home mortgage statement. Like we'll take anything, um, but please have the address on your proof of residency match where you want your rebate check sent to. Also, when you fill out your rebate form, the name you're putting there, that's the name we write the check to. So don't put your nickname if you want like your full name, okay? So uh, that's, and so what I wanna show you too is that we use um, a bill.com payment app system and um, it, it makes it quicker because uh, we're not relying on our accountant to write all the checks. So it just is done automated, but the checks get mailed from California which is a little odd for a DC rebate program. So don't throw away, it's not a scam. Don't throw away this, this 
this uh, envelope. It doesn't say Institute for Local Self-Reliance. It doesn't say home composting. It doesn't say public works, but it does say payment enclosed. So open it up and there'll be a paperwork that says this is your home composting rebate check. So we don't want to have to cancel and reissue because we don't have time for that. So um, here's some prices I did a while ago, probably not up to date just to give you an idea, but the stationary systems tend to be um, less uh, lower price than the tumblers. You may find a cheap tumbler on cheaper tumbler online, but they'll be small. So I think bigger is better for getting the volume and hot composting. And then if you go to dual chamber, it might cost more. If you go into one of the metal systems like the drawer or the mantis, it's even going to cost you more. But you know, read read the reviews. There are some systems that are not covered. Um, those would be like the green cone. It's a digester. It's not technically composting. Could work well for you, but it's just not covered by the by the um, rebate. The geo bin open system not covered by the rebate. There's some fake composters. Anything that plugs in in your kitchen that claims it's a composter and computers compost in 48 hours, not a composter, not covered. Like this two-gallon urban composter for $40, you can't compost in two gallons. That is not covered. Um, a note about composting in the district. This program was part of a law that was passed four years ago, the Home Composting Incentives Amendment Act, and it did clarify that if you're a residential property owner, you have the right to engage in composting on your property, but only in a manner that does not create attract vector problems. Vectors is another word for rodents or mice or raccoons, and you can't create a public nuisance. Those could be bad smells. So if you don't own your property, and you're especially thinking of getting a big bin or installing something bigger, you know, you might want to check with your property manager or land, landlord. So at this point, um, I'm going to run two more polls that we have to see how run them. Okay, you're going to run them. Good. Yeah. And I think, and then we'll just stay on. Um, yeah, so after attending this webinar, are you now inclined to, and you can select all that apply. Of course, we don't want you to say, so start hot composting, learn more about composting, apply for a rebate, avoid composting at home, or take advantage of one of DC's other food scrap recycling options that we talked about at the beginning, the farmer's market subscription service, etc. Okay, closing the poll. All right, looks like close to 90% of you want to apply for rebate. Woohoo! Very excited. And start hot composting. And at almost a third of you want to try one of DC's other food waste recycling options. I think one of you, when you registered, said, you know, how do I decide about joining the nearby, you know, Department of Parks and Rec's community compost versus home composting. I was managing one of those sites for a number of years and it was very exciting. We had some members who joined the cooperative and got used, got learned how to compost as part of the community. It's a great community building effort, by the way. Um, I love doing that. But then there were a few members that said, you know what, I now feel comfortable with it. I'm gonna do home composting. They didn't take this course, but I'm just saying, you know, that's a, it's nice to have options. All right, so the next, the last poll, is um is as an introduction to hot composting at home this webinar had too much information not enough information or the right amount of information all right, all right. just a couple seconds closing poll it looks like we mostly um um, hit the mark, so thank you for that, the right amount of information, and uh, maybe a little bit too much, yes, okay. Um, and then, okay, so that's it for the polls, and I think the last thing uh, to share is, because I know some of you probably need to go, is um, you can, if you want more workshops or the worm workshops, you can email publicworks at zero.waste at dc.gov, and, you know, 
hey, I want the worm workshop, or I want more, or I need another bin type covered, or I want do-it-yourself supplies. <laughs> but if you're sending the rebates, that comes to us at the DC Home Composting at ILSR.org. Um, and then um, just so some of you might want to go and not stay on for questions, what's going to pop up when you leave the webinar is a survey. And I just want to say a word about the demographic questions on there. And this is from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, the nonprofit, that we have an internal goal, goal of reaching um, more diverse audiences. And, um, and so we are asking a few demographic questions that we will use to help us see how well we're doing in meeting our goals. All of the questions are optional, and I just want to verbally commit to you that we will never share uh, personal identifying information on your survey. We don't share the demographic information with Public Works. That's just internal uh, to us. So, um, so just know that that's gonna that's gonna come up. So I think at this point, Linda, we could stop screen sharing, and maybe your um, webcam might work, right? So okay. Me, yes. Yeah. Let's see. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. So, uh, some questions that came up. Uh, would a magazine address, a uh, magazine subscription be sufficient because um, their partner's name is on all of the city documents for the rebate? Um, magazine subscription. It would be better if you had a utility bill. Um, and it has to be your name, not somebody else's name. If you're if you took the workshop, it has to be something that's tied to your name. Okay, but email us; we'll work with you. Mm -hmm. We want you to get your rebate and your yeah. bill. We we will make sure that that happens. So, yeah. uh, can we drop off applications and pick up checks from ILSR's office to help save post office time? No, because uh, we don't, Linda and I don't, get, it should be the same thing. They would have to mail the checks to us. So they're going to be mailed directly to you. Um, um, but the rebate, you shouldn't have to, if, if you have an issue with scanning it or taking a picture, I mean, if you can't scan it, don't worry about it. You can take a picture of the rebate application too, just make sure it's in focus. Um, just just uh, email us if you have questions and we'll work with you. Great. Okay. So, uh, if you're using a tumbler, does it have to cure? Does the compost have to cure in the tumbler, or do you have to take it out to cure, uh, and then keep filling the tumbler with fresh material? So it depends. Uh, again, it depends. Um, if you only have one system, uh, you may want to take it out so that it can cure. Um, and again, but being sure that it's being protected in some way. Um, or you can leave it in the tumbler. You just have to stop adding material at some point. Yeah, and when it's not recognizable, you know, food scraps and it's still curing, but it's broken down, you can take it out of the tumbler if you need the volume. So exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So is there an issue with adding compost to your existing garden soil year after year without adding more new soil? Will it eventually become all compost? And I would say that it's definitely worth, uh, if you're a serious gardener and you're adding compost every year, it's worth uh, getting a soil test done. Um, sometimes the university, uh, UDC offers free soil testing. Um, uh, so it's worth checking that out. It's just good to know um, what you're working with in terms of nutrients and pH and organic matter, but uh, when it relates to compost, um, salt levels is something you have to be aware of. Uh, but getting your soil tested is a good thing anyway, because uh, uh, heavy metals are something that could be present in your soil. It's good to know about, uh, so you can move your garden if you need to, if you can. Um, and then if you're really serious, getting your compost professionally tested every once in a while is always uh, always a good thing because um, then you can compare the two things um, and really balance your soil with precision. So. Yeah, and I'll just add one of the reasons we, we don't recommend planting uh, in a hundred percent compost is because of things like this pH or salinity. One of the nice things about compost, it has a neutral pH um, typically, so it's it's a good makes one of the reasons it makes such good soil amendment. But if you for some reason your feedstocks have a high 
uh, salinity, your, your compost, so that can impact the cation exchange capacity and the nutrients. So that's why 25 to 30 percent by volume compost is a, is a good thing. But I've been adding compost to my garden year after year, and I don't really pay much attention to it, but I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a serious gardener, but mm -hmm. I, I like to, I have a lot of things growing, so yeah. let us know how it goes. Mm -hmm. We'd like to learn from you all too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're doing the seed germination test too, um, I think that'll, what grows in your garden will tell you a lot. Um, so how do you verify that, how do we verify, verify that they, that attendees attended the webinar? Um, this, one of the reasons why we use the GoToWebinar platform, it actually gives us an a, attendee um, report afterwards. So it, it tells us that you were on the, the webinar. So we know. <laughs> we know. Um, so you right. don't need to do anything. We know. Um, Are there any rebates for pitchforks, hoses, temperature probes, um, for people who are part of a community composting project? No, the rebate doesn't cover that. But, you know, if you want rebates in the city to support funding, that's where you can contact your elected city council, your city council members and your reps and the public works and let them let them know that you'd like more funding for this kind of thing. They, they It's good for them to hear that compost is growing in the city and there's more needs out there. Mm -hmm. And the DC DPR compost cooperative network um, is great to be in touch with if you're not already part of that network. Uh, I'm not sure if they're adding more sites, but um, being part of the network uh, has many benefits. Um, and there is a tool sharing uh, program through that, uh, through the DPR. So, uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think that's it. That's it. All right, within two hours. Yay. All yeah. right, happy composting, everybody. Get us Get us those rebates um, applications, and we'll get you your rebate checks as soon as we can. All right? So thanks, everybody, for spending a Monday evening with us. Yes. Sorry for the technical glitches. Thank you all. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Bye, Linda. Bye, Bye Brenda.